Hello, I'm Declan Fanning. Welcome to the first take. Rolling Stones and Time is on my side there. We ended episode two chatting about John Goodman. Here we are again, 1998. John Goodman starring alongside Denzel Washington in Gregory Hoblet's uh, crime thriller Fallen. It's the story of a cursed fallen angel called Azazel who taunts Washington's detective John Hobbs by singing the Rolling Stones song. There's kind of a great scene where Azazel is touching other people walking down the street and they're all continuing the song one by one and it's just an eerie kind of song that I never really used in that context. It's weird, you you know, you pick up a song, put it somewhere else and suddenly it seems a bit more different than you're used to. Anyway, um, the name John Hobbs, which is Washington's character, uh, is based on two philosophers from the 17th century. There was John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. And Locke thought that men were rational creatures capable of a peaceful existence. Uh, Hobbes thought men were evil and needed like governance to make them better. So both these themes are like investigated through this film. There's good versus evil, light versus dark, stones versus the Beatles. It's not really, but you know what I mean, only messing. Um, This film is one of many that uses Rolling Stone songs. Uh, Apocalypse Now uses I I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Full Metal Jacket uses uh, Paint of Black. Be more on a bit of Full Metal Jacket later on. And the Royal Tenenbaums uses uh, Ruby Tuesday. And then, of course, there's Martin Scorsese. Because Scorsese loves, 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 loves the Stones. Where to start with him? Uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash, 1973. That's used in, in Mean Streets. Um, there's like all seven minutes, 16 seconds of Can't You Hear Me Knocking is in 1995's Casino. And then there's Gimme Shelter, which was heard in Goodfellas, in The Departed. Uh, it was in two different scenes in Casino. So Scorsese just like loves the Stones. Scorsese's great at music full stop for his soundtracks. But anyway, uh, Martin Charles Scorsese uh, was born in Flushing, New York on November the 17th, 1942. 
He's directed 25 feature length films so far, 16 documentaries. Uh, one of my favourite ones he's done is 1974's The Last Waltz. It's a concert film um, held on Thanksgiving, I found out, which is November 25th, 1976. And from that film, this is the band with. The night they drove while Dixie down. The Last Waltz was advertised as the band's farewell concert appearance. Special guests that night included Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Neil Diamond, just to name a few. The drummer and vocalist Levon Helm previously had quit the band, and which is actually a really annoying name for a group, because the amount of times you'd say, "Have you heard the band? What band? The band band." And then if you know if they had a song that was I don't know full of curse words, then the band would have a band song. 
which band song anyway so anyway Lee, Lee Von Helm he quit in 1965 but returned to the band in 1967 see there it is again already you just returned anyway so after the breakup of the band <clears throat> Um, Helm went on to act in numerous different productions. He played Loretta Lynn's father in 1980's The Coal Miner's Daughter. In 1983, he starred alongside Scott Glenn in the US space launch film The Right Stuff. Um, not to be confused with the New Kids on the Block song, The Right Stuff. It's probably a reference people won't get. But anyway, uh, Scott Glenn has been like a strong character actor since he first began acting way, way back in 1965. He's got a granite kind of gravelly growl that he adds to loads of films. Like he was in Apocalypse Now, he was in Urban Cowboy, and in 1991 he was in the two films I remember him from, which is The Silence of the Lambs and then in Backdraft. Now Backdraft was like a really terrible, brilliant, awful movie, but he played John Axe Adcox in it. And obviously he was called Axe because he used an axe. There's original names everywhere like that. He was alongside the McCaffrey brothers, Stephen and Brian. They were played by Kurt Russell and William Baldwin. This is when the Baldwins were at their, the Baldwins were at their height, Baldwins were everywhere. So anyway, uh, in the film, Axe fights a fire, which turns the flames into an actual character, which is really, really strange because like the, the the flames on the side of my face, as Mrs. White would say, but the the flames became oh, like Azazel in Fallen was like a demon that was trans like put into people, and you could see you know it was manif manifested itself, but the fire was just the way it would come, and you know always touch the door handle. There's things you remember from Backdraft. Anyway, so look in the making of the film, Scott. Scott Glenn actually caught on fire for one scene, but he was coated in like a special gel so he wouldn't get burned. But um, he was quoted as saying that making Backdraft gave him a new respect for like a firefighter. There's loads of things about Backdraft. So like William Baldwin claims that to this day, if a fire truck sees him down the road, they'll always like honk their horn at him, which is pretty cool. Co-star Jennifer Jason Lee reportedly told the director Ron Howard of Happy Days fame that uh, she wishes she was the fire because that's the best part of the film. And it is, people remember the fire and it's just... It just became a life of its own. Um, the film was actually the first collaboration between Ron Howard, the director, and the musical composer Hans Zimmer. They reunited 15 years after this for the 2006 film The Da Vinci Code. But the German-born Zimmer has to date scored over like 150 films. And the one piece that always comes to mind when I'm thinking of Hans Zimmer is from 1993's True Romance. And this is You're So Cool.
you're so cool by Hans Zimmer there. So True Romance, right? People know a lot about True Romance, but Quentin Tarantino sold the script to Tony Scott for fifty thousand dollars, and he used famously used that money to go off and make Reservoir Dogs. So Tarantino launched himself into the world in nineteen ninety two with that heist film, and followed it up two years later in ninety four with uh, Pulp Fiction. So time for another random fact, and people probably know, but I'll, I'll give it anyway. So Pulp Fiction was produced by a company called Jersey Films. One of the founders of Jersey Films was a certain uh, actor, Danny DeVito. DeVito had met Tarantino a few years earlier, and said, and quote, "I've met someone who talks." faster than Martin Scorsese. DeVito went on to tell uh, Tarantino, look, I want to make a deal with you. Whatever your next movie is, whatever it is, I want in. And he did. So he just gave him like a, like a blank check. He, he believed him that much. So that next film after DeVito met him was Pulp Fiction. And so the story uh, goes that Tarantino named two characters in the film, Jules and Vincent, played by Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta, after Julius and Vincent Benedict, which was the characters played by Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito in the 1988 film Twins. Tarantino was known for his choices in music for his films, as much as the films themselves. So from Kill Bill Volume 1, this is Nancy Sinatra with Bang Bang My Baby Shot Me Down. I was five and he was six, we rode on horses made of sticks. He wore black and I wore white He would always win the fight Bang, bang, he shot me down Bang, bang, I hit the ground Bang, bang, that awful sound Bang, bang, my baby shot me down came and changed the time when I grew up I called him mine he would always laugh and say remember when we used to play bang bang I shot you down bang bang you hit the ground bang bang that awful sound bang bang I used to shoot you Music played and people sang Just for me the church bells rang day sometimes I cry he didn't even say goodbye he didn't take the time to lie bang bang he shot me down bang bang I hit the ground bang bang that awful sound bang bang my baby shot me Nancy Sinatra there with Bang Bang, My Baby Shot Me Down from Kill Bill Volume 1. So every week we could have a Tarantino song, but it won't happen because it's too easy. Um, so I'll try and stay away from doing it repetitively the whole time. So Nancy Sinatra was the first child of Frank and Nancy Sr. Her first television appearance was with her dad and Elvis Presley in 1959 in the Frank Sinatra show. Her songs have been used in multiple productions, but the one that always stands out for me is probably 1987's Full Metal Jacket and the use of the boots are made for walking. It just kicks in and you see a pair of legs walking down and, you know, off it goes. But the one thing people seem to forget about that, they remember that iconic bit. It's kind of used and, you know, if you ever see a trailer for it on TV or, or something like that, you'll see you'll see the pair of boots going down and you'll see like Joker kind of sitting around and people, all their privates sitting around and like, smoking and drinking beer. But, um... That just comes immediately after uh, Private Pyle's death in the toilet. So uh, 
the, the juxtaposition from like you know Pyle sitting there with the gun that's just blasted his head off to Vietnam where the cadets have graduated so like it, it's just hits you it's like war is here two different kinds of war you know there's there's the war that happens where people have, having to just survive and that's not even the real war the real war is what happens when you actually go into the trenches you go to these places and it was kind of a bit of dark humour by, by Stanley Kubrick so yeah uh, the director Stanley Kubrick he, he like kind of neutralised the suicide of uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's um, private pile with like the over the top hilarity of a persuasive prostitute in one swift transition also the boots are made for walking is is it's like a deliberate choice by him because apparently boots uh, or boot is a term for a junior marine which is what Joker and Cowboy and all the rest of them wore so there you go Full Metal Jacket was a 1987 war drama it was told in two parts it was like the boot camp and then it was Vietnam and famously it was shot in London the scene where soldiers are walking through hell singing the Mickey Mouse show theme was actually in London it was the Royal Docks like you know there's burning building and rubble all around them and there you are, right in the middle of London. So the film starred Matthew Modine as a reluctant, uh, competent private joker. According to the co-star Vincent D'Onofrio, the production for the film was so long that Modine managed to get married. He conceived a child. The child was born and then the child turned one all during filming. That's how long Kubrick took. Kubrick was notorious. Um, he would demand multiple takes. Probably the most well-known of that would be the baseball scene in The Shining where the author are taking 127 takes, which is a, a world record in the Guinness books, uh, per Shelley Duvall and Jack Nicholson. There's people devoted to that. There's actually an amazing documentary too called Room 237, which deals with all different kind of theories about what Kubrick was planning to do. So Kubrick uh, had The Shining and he, he based it on, on the book by Stephen King. Um, in September 1974, the author Stephen King and his wife spent the night in the Stanley Hotel, which was where the Overlook Hotel was based on. Um, they were the only guests in the entire property. And that night, King had a nightmare about his three-year-old son running, screaming through the hotel's corridors. According to King, um, he woke up sweating all over within an inch of falling out of the bed. By the time he got up and finished his cigarette, he did an entire plot of The Shining mapped out in his head. See, the, the Overlook was just, the Overlook was kind of like the flames in uh, Backdraft. It was a it was a character in itself. It, it was secluded. It was on the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And it just had like the, the eeriness. And like, if you've ever been in a hotel at night walking to your room, they are, well, I keep using the word creepy, but they are, they're just, there's they're, there's an eeriness to, nobody likes, nobody likes walking those corridors uh, at nighttime alone. Um, the film starred Jack Nicholson, who'd been acting for like over five decades. There's, loads of, of backstory to that but I'm not going to go into it this time instead I'm going to talk about 1989's Batman where uh, Jack Nicholson played the Joker <laughs> so we've gone from private Joker to Joker so from the soundtrack of the album it was the 11th studio album um, by Prince this is part
1989's Batman. So, alongside Jack Nicholson's Joker in Tim Burton's 1989 film was Michael Keaton as the Dark Knight. Nicholson was offered the role of Joker, but he hesitated. And in the time between, Robin Williams was actually offered the role and accepted the role. As a last ditch move, the Batman producers approached Jack Nicholson and told him, look, Williams is going to get the part if you don't want it. Nicholson was him and ham and things like that. So Nicholson actually accepted. So Williams was released from his contract. Robin Williams uh, apparently was not happy at being used as bait. So much so that he refused to play the Riddler in 1995's Batman Forever. The role going to Jim Carrey instead, he held that grudge the whole time too. But in fairness, you would, you know, he just was being dangled a carrot. Batman is known for its colourful cast of criminal characters, but things nearly look very, very differently. Michelle Pfeiffer was actually dating Batman himself, Michael Keaton, at the time it came out, it was being made. And she was asked to audition for the role of Vicky Vale, which went to Kim Basinger. Michael Keaton was totally against the idea, saying that it could be slightly awkward. And as it goes, Pfeiffer was not cast, Kim Basinger was cast, but Pfeiffer was later cast in 1982's sequel, Batman Returns. She played Selina Kyle stroke Catwoman alongside Keaton. So look, things could have worked out so much more worse if the, the, the initial casting had gone ahead, because people like, you know, Selina Kyle, Michelle Pfeiffer, it's a memorable performance. Batman Returns was a much, much darker installment. It's more how the fans would expect um, a Tim Burton film to be and a Batman film to be. In fact, both the director, uh, Tim Burton, and Michael Keaton say that they much prefer this film, Batman Returns, to the first one. Uh, in Batman, uh, Billy D. Williams, uh, Lando Calrissian, uh, he was cast as Harvey Dent. So at one stage, the plan was for him to return in Batman Returns and kind of complete the Two Face arc, where Harvey Dent, you know, where Harvey Dent gets his his face assets thrown in his face in the courtroom. But that character was um, renamed in the sequel to uh, Max Shrek, and all of Harvey Dent's lines were were put on to the Max Shrek character, and every reference to Two Face was completely erased. So in 1985's Batman Forever, the one Robin Williams turned down, Jim Carrey became the Riddler. Billy Dean, Billy Dee Williams actually had a contract which um, stipulated that he had a character reprisal, which means if they ever brought back Two Face, that he would have to be Two Face. So he was uh, actually paid off, and Tommy Lee Jones was cast instead as Harvey Dent and Two Face. So in a in a in a weird world, 95's Joel Schumacher Batman Forever could have had Robin Williams as the Riddler and could have had Billy Dee, Billy Dee Williams as Two Face, which would have been a lot of a different film, I think. Um, according to the casting director, uh, Marion Doherty, uh, Tim Burton was initially uncomfortable with the casting of Christopher Walken as the replacement uh, Harvey Dent, the Max Shrek character. He, uh, Burton is quoted as saying, that man scares the hell out of me. So Christopher Walken is like, one of the West best known kind of um, actors in the last 50 years. He has a distinct style. He's acted in more than 100 films from like 1978's A Deer Hunter, 1985's A Video Kill, which in my mind is one of the best Bond films, even though it's terrible, but it's brilliant. 1990's uh, King of New York, 1985's The Prophecy, which you haven't seen, is another kind of uh, fallen angel film, much like uh, Azazel was in Fallen earlier on. Um, but in 2012, he started alongside Colin Farrell and Sam Rockwell and Martin McDonough's Seven Psychopaths. So it was a comedy drama involving like a dog napping and loads of schemes and this quick witted banter back and forth. So McDonough and Farrell had actually teamed up uh, four years earlier in another kind of black comedy, which is In Bruges. Uh, that's another film full of like memorable moments. Um, but perhaps the most kind of standout moment is a scene involving Brendan Gleeson's character, Ken. So there's just a scene where it's being accompanied by Luke Kelly singing Raglan Road and it sticks out in my mind the whole time. So this is Luke Kelly. On Raglan Road Of an autumn day I saw her first And knew That her dark hair Would weave a snare that I might one day rule I saw the danger and I passed Along the enchanted way And I said let grief be a fallen leaf at the dawning of the day On Grafton Street In November We trip lightly along the ledge 
Of a deep ravine where can be seen the worth of passion's pledge. The queen of hearts still making tarts, and I'm not making hay. Oh, I loved too much, and by such, by such, is happiness thrown away. I gave her gifts of the mind, I gave her the secret sign that's known to the artists who have known. The true gods of sound and the stone And word and tint without stint I gave her poems to say With her own name there And her own dark hair like clouds over fields of May On a quiet street Where old ghosts meet I see her walking now Away from me so harassed my reason must allow That I had loved not as I should A creature made of clay When the angel woos The clay he'd lose his wings at the dawn of day. Luke Kelly and Raglan Road there used amazingly in uh, in, in in Bruges. In in Bruges, it's kind of like the band, the band again. In in Bruges, but that's not the only time Luke Kelly's been used to kind of bump up a scene in. Guy Ritchie's 2009 version of Sherlock Holmes back in the days of Cumberbatch doing Sherlock Holmes it was Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes Sherlock Holmes was everywhere for a while but Kelly's uh, Rocky Road to Dublin was used both over a fight scene in the film and towards the end credits so Guy Ritchie much like uh, Tarantino is like known for this use of music you think of like you know James Brown's The Boss in Lockstock or even Zorba the Greek uh, which builds attention in Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels as well Just as, uh, or even like Brad Pitt um, when he played like One Punch Mickey in in a and Snatch, you know, he was getting ready for, for the fight and there's the Oasis song effing in the bushes or the dog chasing scene in Snatch. The Murray's uh, disco science. But for me, the kind of the best use of Richie and his music was at the end of Snatch when Huey, Piano Smith and the Clowns just kick in. Uh, it just leaves a smile on my face. And this is that song. This is Don't You Just Know It.
Huey, Piano Smith and the Clowns there with Don't You Just Know It, which was used in Snatch, the 2009 Guy Ritchie film. It's a belter song. So Snatch, amongst others, starred like Jason Statham, Stephen Graham, Dennis Farina, Benicio Del Toro and Vinnie Jones. Um, Jones, of course, began his uh, big screen acting career in 1998's Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. He used to play for Wimbledon, he used to play for Sheffield United, he used to play for Leeds in football, or as it's better known, soccer, because football over here is GAA, and uh, that's a whole argument to go into. Jones, for a while, was known to be, like, known for starring in big Hollywood blockbusters. He was kind of the flavour of the month for a while. He was in, like, Gone in 60 Seconds, he played Juggernaut in X-Men The Last Stand, he was even in Garfield 2. In 2016, he starred in a, the remake of The Magnificent Seven. He was in an uncredited role, but there he was, popping up beside um, Peter Sarsgaard as one of his kind of goons. Uh, the film was like a very loose, interpreta- loose in- interpretation of the 1960s John Sturge's Magnificent Seven, which in turn was based on 1954's Akira Kurosawa film, The Seven Samurai. The actual 2016 version starred like Chris Pratt, Ethan Hawke, Vincent uh, D'Onofrio, who we spoke about from Full Metal Jacket earlier, and it also starred Denzel Washington, who was the star of our first film, 1998's Fallen, so we have gone full circle. Uh, I'm going to leave you today with Elmer Bernstein's legendary theme from The Magnificent Seven. It's guaranteed to put a smile on your face, it's just nice, and it just remind, reminds me of like Steve McQueen and Neil Brenner just being the, the kings of cool, um, and just with films where you know you, you can watch them now on a Saturday at 3pm or Sunday in the middle of the afternoon fire lit and just enjoy them they're they're timeless so for myself Declan Fanning thanks for listening chat to you soon